Please welcome His Excellency Majid Al Swaidi, Director General, COP28, and Moderator Hala Hana, Executive Director, Saul. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. Though I have your permission to call you Majid, so I'll do that. Sure. <laughs> Uh, but this is a big week for you, um, and I know that within COP28 you focus particularly on the financing part. Um, so, by the way, we have 10 minutes, and I would love 10 hours, so we're going to just jump right in. Um, but tell us, um, you know, if there are any sets of solutions out there that need a huge infusion in capital that would be climate solutions, and we have some of them here today, would love to hear you put in context the billions and the trillions that we're hearing about. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here um, in this conversation and to be part of the, the, the discussions that are going on. The UNGA is such an important uh, milestone when it gets, when it's to, when we on the way to COP. And COP28, we hope, is going to be that real game-changing COP. We've been on a listening tour over the course of this year, and we continue every day hearing from people. And we've we've gone around, we've engaged with with civil society, with NGOs, with youth groups, with uh, indigenous peoples, with everybody we could possibly meet to come up with our vision for, for COP. And that's really formed around four ideas. One being, how do we fast track the energy transition? Because energy at, is at the heart of the emissions gap that we have. 43% uh, of emissions are still, um, we need to mitigate. So how do we make that happen? The second thing, and we need to decarbonize the energy system we have today while we build up that new energy system uh, that we want to get to. So we need to start to talk about what we're giving people instead of all the time talking about what we're taking away. And so that is th two thirds of emissions. The second focus for us, which we heard consistently as we went around the world, was the finance piece that you mentioned. So how are we going to raise the trillions of dollars that we're going to need in annual investment to invest in things like energy, but some of the other issues as well that I'll talk about later. Um, and how do we do that at speed? Because we have seven years to 2030. And then the third piece is for us about people. How do we make COP and COP28 about people? That's the adaptation story. Food, health, water. Um, how do we make a COP that delivers a difference for the average man, woman, young person, indigenous person on the ground, and does it again at speed, mm -hmm. not in 10, 20 years. And the last piece is, is that inclusivity, bringing everybody together. And so to answer your question, we need to invest across the board in each of these different types of solutions, and we need to break down some of the many barriers that are preventing finance from getting to them really quickly, because we know that today, um, a large proportion of climate investments happening in the developed world. While the majority of emissions growth is happening in the developing world, mm -hmm. we need to flip that, that equation so that we're seeing capital mobilized in the developing and emerging markets as quickly as possible. Mm. Thank you for that. I, um, it was interesting to hear you talk about bringing in uh, you know, the current emitters uh, as you are building what's next. Uh, and you've, I think this COP28 is particularly um, kind of focused on including private sector. Uh, can you tell us about that, how you've gone about it? I mean, particularly for a country like the UAE, which is uh, you know, an oil producer, of course. I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah, when we approached this, uh, the COP, as a COP presidency, we really came at it in a very humble way, um, saying, you know, what could we do to make a difference? When we started, our instructions from our leadership was they didn't just want to have another COP in a series of COPs that add, added incrementally to the story. There's been fantastic work, but we felt that the importance of this COP comes from the fact that we're host of the global stock take. Mm -hmm. This is the first assessments from the Paris Agreement um, of where we are. The main goal of Paris is that keeping global temperatures under 1.5 degrees. And we know that we're way off track, and the recent report confirmed that. We've been saying that all year. So what that means is, is that we need to have game-changing solutions. We need to have big steps forwards. And, and so we, we need to approach this differently. 
what are we going to do to make sure that we're mobilizing solutions in a different way? And Glasgow was the first COP that really engaged the private sector. I'd say for myself in Sharm el-Sheikh, I also noted the big difference in COPs. The last COP that I was involved in, I was the lead climate change negotiator in Paris. I went away for a few years and did some other things and came back. And what I noticed was that we were having the same conversations over and over, but, but in many ways, what we're trying to achieve has changed. In Paris, we were trying to achieve a political outcome. Now, we're trying to achieve results on the ground, right? We're trying to receive, achieve action, implementation. And that means that we need to do what we've talked about for years, leverage government, policy, finance, um, incentives, use that to leverage the private sector and bring private sector in at scale. Because to solve these big problems, we need scale. We need everybody coming in. And so how do we think about doing that? And we can't do that by having an exclusive conversation of some negotiators and perhaps some, some uh, activists. We need to have an inclusive conversation that brings everybody to the table. It brings those activists who drive and give us passion, but it also brings CEOs and, and industry and, and academics and uh, you know, scientists to help us come together and have a conversation. And yes, we need to have indigenous people, young people. Everybody has a contribution, and we want to create the platform and the space where we can bring people together and we can um, hopefully find those big ideas. You know that that's what the UAE is about. That's what Dubai is about. Many of you have been to Abu Dhabi and Dubai and seen how we do a great job of bringing the public and private sectors together to deliver big outcomes. And I think that that's what we're trying to do at COP28. Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, perspective. And it's really inspiring to hear you talk um, you know, uh, about the, the consultation process, especially with youth and the indigenous uh, communities, I would love, you, you, how have these consultations changed what you're planning to do for COP28? You know, it's been a real educational tour for us. I think we always knew that the importance of youth, for instance, you know, we we very early on decided to nominate a youth champion to give a formal voice for young people in the process. That's been part of our development story in the UAE. We had uh, our Minister of Youth, who is our youth champion, Her Excellency Sheikh Mohammed Mazri, was the youngest minister when she was appointed at 22 years old. And she did a great job of bringing the voice of young people into government policy making. And we felt that that was sort of a natural part of our development story. And so that's why we wanted to bring that to the COP. But the more that we went down that that road and the more we engaged with civil society, NGOs, indigenous people, the more we felt really confident that this was a good decision to have that very inclusive process. We, we had great conversations with indigenous people in Brazil, in, uh, in, in Africa, in, in different places that I think really add so much value and so much depth to, to the work around nature-based solutions, around um, I think I saw a stat that said that they're, they, they defend or, or protect 80% of the world's uh, biodiversity. This is a, a community that needs to be engaged, and, and I think that I learned a lot, certainly, about how uh, they have for a long time been excluded from those conversations, and so what can, we, co what can we do to change that? We need to think about how we have these conversations. How do we bring this knowledge into the process? There's a component of COPs that is a negotiated intergovernmental process. We have to protect and preserve that and empower it, but there's plenty of room for us to have conversations with civil society, with NGOs, with all sorts of other groups and bring them into the conversation that, make, that delivers real action and, and outcomes on the ground. Um, that's very, very encouraging. Thank you for that. What is the hardest part of your job? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love my job at the moment. I feel that I get to work <laughs> with young people. I get to, <laughs> I think that I, 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 perhaps not the hardest part. I'll, I'll tell you uh, an experience that I had recently that was illuminating and was um, uh, that I felt very fortunate to have, but was also difficult. Um, recently, we went to Kenya and um, we went for the Africa Climate Summit where we, we were, we had a a great announcement of $4.5 billion investment in, in African clean energy. And in that trip, um, I was able to go with UNHCR to visit uh, the Dadaab refugee camp. 
and this was part of our inclusion and uh, tour, of listening tour. We wanted to go and give a voice to those people who are impacted by climate change in a, you know, in a vulnerable situation. And I had a series of conversations, one with uh, a, a, a lady who had come to the camp. I was told she was a newcomer. When I asked her how long she'd been there, she'd been there a year. She had nine children. She was heavily pregnant. She had uh, a makeshift shelter that, that I had the privilege to, to be invited into. I, when I asked her why she had you know, come there, which was essentially in the middle of the desert, um, she said that she had been impacted by drought. She, was a, she had had a farm, she had cattle, but drought had destroyed her crops. She'd had to sell, many of her cattle had died, she'd had to sell them off. And she'd come to this camp to provide water and food and, and, and some kind of education to her children, for her children, um, and to at least have some kind of a future. And I think that sometimes when we're thinking about all of these big macroeconomic ec issues, these big political issues, we forget about that woman who's been a year in a makeshift shelter in an arid uh, place in a camp. And we think of a camp, this was the other thing that struck me. We think of a few thousand people. This was a camp of 300,000 people. This was a city. Mm -hmm. um, and, as a, and, the, and then another part of the conversation, we were talking to a women's group a small number of, of the women were, were younger uh, teenage uh, uh, girls who, who wanted to ask for uh, a question, and I was really happy to hear it. And they mentioned that they had one latrine for every 100 people. And, that, and, and so the things that, that I learned from this was that there are people in real vulnerable situations. There are people who contributed absolutely nothing to the problem and are impacted the most. And we need to think about how we are making a difference for those people first. What are we doing to make the changes we need to do to t keep global temperatures under 1.5? And that has been our North Star. We, we try to avoid getting hung up on the, the sort of mi minutia of various political positions and focus on that 1.5 degrees because if we don't address that we're going to have more examples of, of this uh, lady and her situation and we, we can't do that. So we need to start to make serious decisions about and have honest conversations coming back to where we started on energy. We know we have an energy system today that we use that we can't switch off how do we have a conversation about that and about how we transition, decarbonize the one we have and move to the one we, we want to get to so that we can start to address it in a meaningful and, and sustainable way? Wonderful. Thank you. Well, this is all the time we have, but um, I really wish you a great COP28. The world needs it. And thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you.